Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, and by Rainex, Hum by Verizon, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. And thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome to MotorWeek podcast number 193. I'm John Davis, and joining me in Studio C at MotorWeek World Headquarters is writer-producer Brian Robinson. Hello, John. Online content coordinator Greg Carlos. Hey. We are honored with FYI reporter Stephanie Hart joining us today. Thank you. And video producer, editor, and who is the producer of the podcast, Joe Ligo. Alive and here. Okay, we've got a viewer question, a motorcycle test, and an important anniversary. But first, 2019 BMW X4 has recently been in our garage. Uh, everybody chime in. The particular model we had had the 3-liter turbo i6, 355 horsepower, all-wheel drive, HBA auto, 0 to 60 in 4.6 seconds, yada, 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 $60,000. Mm. Is it worth it? What is it? First of all, someone describe versus, say, an X3, what is like an X4? The creature from the black. I'm, I'm going to ask Brian Robinson yeah. to do it. Go ahead. It's a uh, more stylish version of the X3, uh, but less practical. Coupized. It's yes. coupized. <laughs> Apparently, I mean, what the, I was, uh, it had, it's a it's a five door coupe. If I were to Look. describe it, I would go a little bit more of a roundabout way. It's like a Mercedes Benz GLE with a no. BMW GLE is that same type of yeah. Well, one car, model right? is yeah. I think it looks well, extremely similar. You can well, get they do. GLEs and GLCs that are, know, that are not coupes. Yeah, you G can get I mean, you can get the box right, right. or you can okay, get the, right. uh, the coupish. No. I, it looks like a GL. See how confused we are? BMW well, BMW that. started it with the X6. Right. They started the coupe thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Making a four-door SUV and calling it a coupe. Right. Well, they started but Mercedes started that with the cars first, so right. by you know, so lot of, Anyway, uh, anyway, let's confused. get back to the X4. What was it like Driving it, you made some comments before we uh, started rolling about the uh, the M40i, what it sounded like when you started it up. Yeah, we had a, we did have the M40i, which is really fast and also really loud. I sit, we're, so we're in the basement office below ground. But we have glass. Yeah, and I'm in my office pretty far Actually, back. Actually, you you don't have glass. You're about three no, offices I'm back. Well, I'm well insulated, yeah. and somebody started it up in our back lot, and I could hear it like it was right next to me. And then to get outside, it's just, it's, it's super loud. And, you know, if you're buying an X4 or an M40i, sure, you probably want that. But I was just taken aback by how loud it was. They'll know you're coming. It's, it's a cool looking machine. It's a, it, I thought it was a good looking machine, but I, driving I it, there's something it. else about it. It's, you, you do feel like, you feel like you're in kind of a clamshell. You know, it's like, it's kind of hard to see out of it. Small back glass. Yeah. You're like squinting to see. Thank goodness it's got good backup cameras. Super fun to drive. I, uh, you know, we've been um, ranting on BMW with their lack of feedback in cars. I thought that car had a lot of feedback to it driving yeah. it. Super fun, but, I mean, you just have to hate practicality to buy that over an <laughs> X3. You know, I guess with, you know, versus the X6, which I, I, is a lot more money, it seemed like they scaled everything down, but they forgot that people still had to be on the inside of it. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, it's almost too small. I thought. When you look at it, say, compared to the X3, which I think is a very generously styled vehicle. It looks big on the yeah. outside. That yeah. grill, the kidney grill, they're really beef. They've got, it's got beef. <laughs> Just <laughs> visual beef. Fun to drive, not very practical, but uh, if you want to send us another one, BMW, we, we'll fight for the keys. And they, they do make a two-liter version if you're not crazy Aww. about it. Come yeah, on. all right, yeah. If you're not an M person, but if you, <laughs> if want you don't want to be curious about it. <laughs> yeah. If you want if you're if you're not an M person, the you can get this two liter turbo. Uh, we are going to do our bike test next, and for that I will turn to Brian Robinson. Why don't you tell us what uh, was underneath your uh, seat? Uh, new uh, Honda Goldwing, all new for 18. First new one in, I don't know, 18, 15, 18 years, something like that. Uh, all new. Right. They had just uh, had a 40th anniversary version a couple years back. You this just one's don't all new. strike me as a Goldwing person. Um, I could be. took an Indian all the <laughs> way. Yeah, exactly. I, I could be. If I, I could be. Uh, the, the, you know, it's the quintessential two-wheeled motorbago motorcycle. <laughs> 
like for that old people <laughs> drive across the country. But let's I, not let's not insult too many it, of our. Well, viewers. it was at a crossroads because people that have traditionally bought that are no longer buying motorcycles for whatever reason, and then you have on the other side of there's two touring motorcycle worlds. There's the sport tours like the BMWs, mm -hmm. and then there's the cruisers like the Harleys and the Indians. And you know the Honda was kind of right there in between. Doesn't really appeal to either one. And uh, they kind of felt like they had to make it appeal more to one of those groups. Uh, so they it's they made it much sporty uh, than any sportier than any previous Goldwing. It's almost like a sport tour now to do that. Um, they took a lot of weight out of it, almost 100 pounds. Well, that's a lot. But they also cycle. made it a little smaller and took some storage capacity out of it, which has got all of their traditional buyers uh, very upset about that. Uh, you can still get the traditional bike, right? No, no, it's smaller. There's, there's, uh, when you were doing the road test, what, oh, right, is, right, what right. is the other bike? There's the, that, the base Goldwing. The base one. Correct. Doesn't come with a top trunk and uh, some accessories. That used to be the Goldwing F F6B. Now that's just the base Goldwing. The Goldwing Tour is the what we always think of as the Goldwing. With all the accoutrements and yeah, luggage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's man, it's a, a pleasure to drive. I mean, it's super fast. You like it. Solid. You like it actually better than the old ones, right? Um, for me, yeah, 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 for sure. I, I don't mind. But your hair is not all white yet. So. Storage and uh, it's just super fast. Handles really well. Um, you have to work pretty hard to get stuff to scrape in the corners, unlike you know the previous gen. Um, all in all, I think they did pretty well with it. You made an interesting comment uh -oh. that the, the infotainment <laughs> system that Honda's four wheel division uh, right, could right, learn right. a thing or two from their two wheels. Yeah, so they have you know like everything else, they got to have navigation and, and it, cell phone integration and CarPlay and all that, which they have extremely well integrated. Um, you know, there's thumb controls, there's controls on the tank, uh, and they've done it without. You know, just the previous gen Goldwing uh, had buttons everywhere galore. This they've slimmed down the buttons, made it super simple and uh, easy to operate. And the other notable thing is as a DCT I transmission. Was say, would you which, go for the DCT which, versus um, a manual? If you would ask me before, I probably would have said no. But having spent some time with it, I mean, if you're driving, if you're riding a motorcycle and you just want to be super comfortable and just hit interstates and you know, go to California for the weekend or whatever, you know, why not? Why not just stay in automatic? Works really well. It's got a sport mode that lets you shift up and down. Uh, it's very responsive. Uh, it's, it worked pretty well. Okay, let's move back to four wheels. And Stephanie, we're going to turn this over to you in a second. I'll set the stage. Uh, Ford has done a revamp of their popular Edge uh, crossover. They uh, have made a lot of noise before, even before Stephanie went to the preview, about the new ST model, which they were saying is their first per true performance model and replacing the Edge Sport. Um, however, um, when you look at some of the statistics, it still has the same uh, 2.7 liter turbo V6, a little bit more power. So, Stephanie, we turn to you and say, what was your impression after all of the hype uh, on the new, the uh, revamped Edge in general, but specifically the ST? Um, I thought it was sporty, fun to drive, really fast, <laughs> 0 to 60 in under 6 seconds, and you could really feel the torque going, too. So I liked it. I drove it in Salt Lake City, Utah. I liked the sound the engine made when it revved. It had a cool sound, so... There, there apparently is, in order to make it a true high performance, if you, and I, I use that cautiously, um, SUV, you have to add a couple of packages, which give you summer tires, a uh, uh, more tuned suspension. Now, the ones that you drove, did you drive both a regular ST and this one with all the performance packages on it, or how did it pan out? Did you notice any difference between the two? I drove the Ford Edge ST, and then I drove the Ford Edge Titanium. Okay. So, I mean, the Titanium wasn't as much fun. Um, the Edge ST that I drove had um, high-performance tires. So it had all the yeah, uh, performance accoutrements, which is about yeah. an $8,000 step up. On that vehicle, mm -hmm. from uh, what forty-two and change to uh, fifty-one. So when you, I remember when you came back and you wrote your first comments for uh, the web, you made the point that 
there really isn't anything else from a domestic brand in this class. Mm -hmm. True? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. Because there's, I mean, if you looked at the SRT Grand Cherokee, it's a whole lot more money. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing from GM that I'm aware of. So you, after driving it, you came away impressed. Tell yeah, us more about it. Yeah, the only thing I didn't like, the chassis felt bulkier than, you know, you would expect. Really? Yeah. It's heavier just overall? It's a pretty big vehicle, but I mean, heavier, steering response slow? Um, the steering response was decent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had to pick between the sort of luxury route or the titanium, because Ford sells a ton of titanium yeah, stuff, sure or the sport route for driving every day. Yeah, because you commute every day. I was gonna say, is would you get sick of one, or would you want to be? Do you want to be pampered, or do you want to be a, a show off? <laughs> I mean, for me personally, I wouldn't need a Ford Edge, you know, ST. But you know, for my commute, I could do it with the titanium. But <laughs> Does that it just, mean you like the comfort a little bit more? It, it just depends on sort of what you're looking for. So, but I mean, the Ford Edge ST is certainly fun. You know, I guess after work and on the weekends, and yeah. So, so you just, felt like it lived up to its hype. Um, I think so. Uh, anything else you want to add about it? Uh, it's good looking. For years, you know, we were lusting after, like, the European ST models of yeah. Fords, right? And we finally got them with the Focus and the Fiesta. And they were, like, serious, borderline, non-daily driving performance cars. And now they're putting the ST label on this. So mm -hmm. I'm not, it's almost like what Chevy did with SS, it's you know, a couple years ago. Yeah, just watering it down. But it, it well, seems like they dialed it in from what Stephanie's saying pretty well for American talks taste. Talks of an Edge RS, right? That's a rumor that's yeah. going around, which yeah. would be more... It'd be even more hardcore. What about the rest of the Edge lineup? Did they, I assume they spelled out the improvements or changes for um, the new model year? They're doing a lot more with, um, isn't some of the advanced safety now standard? Yeah, yeah. Automatic braking? Yeah, it comes standard with tons of safety features. Yeah. Uh, Pre-collision assist with automatic emergency braking, which includes pedestrian detection. Mm -hmm. So those are standard, so that's pretty good. That's that's a big deal for that particular class, I would say. I mean, I'm not so sure you can sell any family-oriented SUV without that anymore. Right, and it's odd because the edge is, I guess, kind of above, like... Uh, you know, the we think of we test a lot of cars like CRV and Rav4 and that kind of stuff, but the Edge is kind of a class above that. But and yeah, size too. But a class yeah. below Grand Cherokee, so right. it's kind of in a middle ground where you figure the buyers have the money to buy. They're going to spring maybe for these extra packages where you know if you're just out looking for a cross trek, you're not going to. It's kind of like a large money. compact. I know it's a different it's size. Well, yeah, I I get confused because when I looked back Escape. at what we originally. The way we originally described the Edge when it first came out, I think it was a small for its size, mid-size. But that was the, the last generation. This one is bigger. So, okay, your point's well taken. I think <laughs> this will be the last thing maybe we say on it. But I would rather – I know it's not the same vehicle. I would rather have Ford brought back the Flex – and give us an Edge ST. Remember, how, I, I yeah. love the Flex, and well, I know still, I'm not they, they still make them? They do? <laughs> yeah, they haven't discontinued yet. Yeah. Yeah. Only an up up level yeah. platinum trim. Because it sells very well in oh, California. Yeah. Get out, man. You yeah. Yeah. Bring me back a Flex for a press car. <laughs> flex and bro. They haven't changed them in years. No, I mean, I, it's okay. only it's still its first generation. Yeah. This is a big I box. I've updated it a couple times. Yeah, yeah I remember but, we had the updated one. Yeah. That's the one I fell in love with. They with like the tailgate seats. And that was the one where it sold so well in California that they took the Ford badge off and it just says flex, flex. on the yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's sweet. Does it still have the, the refrigerator armor on there? I think it probably the does. Armrest with the cooler. Well, we're going to stay with Stephanie now for her crown jewel. Uh, she has an FYI story celebrating Hot Wheels' 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. and, let me, and tell me this is one of the coolest stories you've ever oh, done. Oh, yeah, it was great. I got to go into Mattel behind the scenes, um, saw the Hot Wheels, um, met with a design team. So, That's so uh, cool. They showed us how they create the Hot Wheels. Um, so it was it was neat to see the process and sort of um, identify with how they think. Fifty percent of the cars um, are imaginary, actually. And That's a big are... change because originally they actually used, I guess, automotive designers from Detroit, and a lot of the stuff had was similar, you know, to to real stuff. But now it's. The people that are designing them now, do you have any concept of, like, what their motivations are now? Is it just science fiction? I mean... 
Um, I mean, they're actually looking at autonomous vehicles, too, mm, really? and designing some Hot Wheels to mimic those autonomous So vehicles. it won't have a steering wheel, probably. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. 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 It's going to be the market for Hot Wheels when it's autonomous cars. <laughs> hey, so look at this. It car. looks like an Uber. So what, what was, I, I looked at some of your footage with you the other day where you showed they have a giant track, like indoor track in their like cafeteria area. That was Yeah, they had a life, was life-size <laughs> Hot Wheels <laughs> orange yeah, track. Was. That we played with, so that was fun. You didn't get to. You drove on it. Yeah, I did. Oh, cool! <laughs> was it a full size? I just rolled the Hot Wheel down the track. Uh, I'm stupid. I What's was the confused. coolest thing you saw there? I don't want to give away the whole piece, oh. but yeah, there were so many cool highlights. So many cool. All right, highlights. tell us the biggest surprise you had. <laughs> The biggest surprise was yeah. when I got to go in the secret Hot Wheels garage. Whoa. No one really knows it exists, and many now people. They do. Well, yeah, now they do. <laughs> they just gave it away. <laughs> oh well, you never heard that. It didn't have a short door or anything. You had to scrunch under. No, no. Um, they let us in though, and it was it was pretty cool. So there were life size Hot Wheels vehicles in there, and then we saw the 164 scale die cast mm-hmm. um, right next to it. So it was really cool to see the big car and the little car and. Now, they have a museum there as well, right? We didn't get to see that. You just concentrated on the newest, on on the process and what's coming in new new things. Yeah, I mean, we could have spent two weeks there. There was so much to see, so Uh, much to do, and it was really, really interesting. So I'm looking forward to that. Do you think the future of Hot Wheels is bright? From what you saw, the enthusiasm, obviously, is still there with the company. Yeah. I mean, it it seems like a great company, and they're really revved to follow the car culture trends. They also look for ideas from uh, the entertainment industry Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, the toy industry. So they seem to have their pulse on, you know, everything that's going on and staying relevant and staying up with the times. Really cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for that. Can't wait to see it. it. Okay, we're going to switch from uh, Hot Wheels 50th anniversary to our viewer question. Michael is asking, many new cars do not include CD players anymore. And because of the integrated design of these infotainment systems, you can't add an aftermarket unit. Well, that's not quite true. Mm -hmm. I have a huge CD collection. How can I listen to these in newer cars? Uh, I think you can still get an aftermarket player that'll fit like in the glove box. I'm pretty sure you can from people like Crutchfield and so forth. Options, but I'll give you my hot take, even if you don't want it, Um, Michael. I don't want to offend you in any way, but you are. But yeah, I'm not intending to, and I appreciate you asking this question. But just go and put those CDs into your computer. And then put them on your phone or audio player device, and then plug in or go to Bluetooth, log in your Bluetooth in the car, and just listen to them. Sound quality is nice. And if, because if how it's that's the true, same. we're well, talking about a CD. If you're streaming from a streaming service, you're compressing like it. Music, it's not yeah, going to be the same. To your computer, it compresses it. That's right. <sighs> however, well, well, however, okay. How many of those CDs in that book <laughs> were created from? Were burned onto the CD? Well, originally? they're digital. And I'm sure uh, if he has a big collection of CDs, there's going to be a big book. I had it when I was in high school. I had a huge book of CDs. Yeah, but there's there's still the, you're still starting out with a good digital recording. Not always. I was downloading from LimeWire and Napster, which I'm sure everybody was. Yeah. And anyway, oh, you mean I, the ones you made at home? I, I oh. just, I don't uh. think there's, you know, I don't think there's a big enough difference to carry around a book of CDs. And you know what? Uh, rewritable CDs or CDs that you burn don't last forever. Yeah, they that's true. start yeah. going sure. bad. So you're gonna want to put them on your computer anyway. And while you're there, plug in your phone and put them on there. I was, I was thinking, him, I was thinking he had. Bought, he had bought pre-recorded CDs. Now, I did find a solution because I'm too lazy to do what you said. And that is I went out and bought. You can still buy for twenty nine ninety five a little portable CD player that you can either be battery powered or plug into what used to be the cigarette lighter. And then you can plug it in most, you know, if the car's got, if the car's got an aux in, which most cars still do, you can plug that in and listen to it that way. It's not automatic, but what, there is a way of doing it that's pretty cheap. What, what my older brother does, because he hates linking the phone with the Bluetooth and all that garbage, what he did is he went out and bought <laughs> well, it. We have a real this, generational this, gap here. What, what I get did, really heated about this. Listen, what, what he did is he went out and he bought like a 64 gig flash drive. 
loaded up with all his music, plugged it into his car, never touched it again. He's got, you know, hundreds of CDs worth of music all on one flash drive. You plug it in, it, you know, it you never see it, you never think about it. All your music is there, you just have it. I guess it's also it's, why Amazon Prime is popular. As you say, it's it's simpler than doing it the phone way because yeah. then you don't have to worry about like your Bluetooth always connecting. This way, it's just always the music's plugged into the car on a flash drive, and you don't think about it. So Sorry. Anyway, that's all right. I think Michael, we've given you various uh, solutions. None of them probably as easy as putting a CD into a tray in the car, but that's just the way of the world. The, you know, we talked about uh, uh, previously some of the car. There are not too many cars that we get in here that have uh, CD players left. I think Subaru still does, but not very many. So we hope that helps. Um, that was actually a pretty good rant and rave uh, from Michael, but how about the rest of us here? Anything else to complain about or praise? Or Come on, we had one before we even started rolling today. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about it. The, Numbers uh, and letters. Alphabet oh, soup. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of these German car names. Not just Germans, but they're the most it's obvious. spreading offenders. to American car makers. Um, so we're talking specifically, this conversation started with BMW because a 3 Series, the, the naming schemes used to mean something. Right. A 328 would have a 2.8 liter. Correct. Now, a, three, a 2 liter 3 Series is a 330. A 3 liter... 3 series is a 340 and then from there it's just then you can you go to like an X3 there's an M40i option uh, uh, what's the uh, other then you, X, then you get in X drive, X drive, X drive 40i drive. and then Mercedes is no better with their GLCs and GLEs GLE coupes and Formatic. things like that now it's switching over to Cadillac with a CT6 the I wonder I wonder if if buyers are confused, or do they go in with you know a kind of a laser focus of what they want, and they don't care because we we get confused because we see so much stuff. That's a good question. Like, yeah. Is it a like a menu at Waffle House where yeah. you just point to the car instead of saying <laughs> saying I want that and I want the uh, you know I want the uh, the X4 or whatever it is, and I got a choice between a four and does a six. It, and does it sound more exotic? Maybe like does it sound more appealing? Yeah, because I guess. Our luxury brands stick with the alphanumeric. Is that why? Does it sound more appealing than? Because I guess yeah, like there are Kia no, Forte? there are no ma mainstream brands that use alphanumeric. You know, you well, well, if you so the Kia K900, the Kia, their highest level Kia is a K900, right? right? And that's a global car, but every other Kia is it's has, got a name. has a name. So maybe there's something to the luxury. <laughs> it does seem to have separated the luxury brands. Do seem to have gone that route. Uh, where I think the mainstream brands want something where the name is a little more memorable. And then Genesis yeah. moved yeah. to a whole other brand just so they can name. <laughs> the, the problem yeah. is, I think the big complaint, though, that we started with Greg says is that the numbers don't add. The numbers used to mean something. They'll it mean, used to mean your engine size or your something. Now it just now, means better, you know, maybe more power, a bigger engine, right. but that's mm -hmm. it. You just get bigger numbers every year, and the numbers you're going to get, you know, 30 years from now, you're going to drive a BMW 3000, you know, because it just keep adding. <laughs> just have numbers. an old Toyota. That'd be cool. All right. Thanks, guys and madam, ma'am. And let's see if there's anything else we need to cover today. I think we do want to thank our audio engineer, David Wainwright, and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. And I want to thank Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, Stephanie Hart, and Joe Ligo for basically an extremely entertaining podcast, number 193 for Motor Week. And for those of you out there that catch us on some kind of video screen, we want to thank you for watching us on public TV stations across the country and also on Velocity. And if you need more information about Motor Week, head on over to our website, either at pbs.org slash motorweek or motorweek.org. Thanks once again for being a part of our show, and we'll see you right here on Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, and by Rainex, Hum by Verizon, and State Farm.